okay. Jonathan, what is going on with this tree? Um, we, we've got a tree here that looks like it was preserved early um, in construction, but it has a lot of concrete covering the root zone. Yeah, um, it's a small area. It is a small area. Uh, and we have these mature trees back here on the wood line that are definitely older. And so what it's caused is this is, is grown out to get light. And as it's grown out to get light, it's created what we call phototropic lean. Okay. Okay. And it seems like a pretty severe lean. Is this something we should be worried about? I am not as worried about this lean. Okay. Uh, because this lean has developed over the entire tree's life. Okay. You know, this tree has grown that way the whole time instead of become instead of developing a lean all at once. But you think even with the severity of the lean that the roots are established enough to keep it upright? I think With if you small... look at the age of the concrete yeah. right here, we're, we're talking pretty old concrete that has a lot of cracking in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking comparatively to the age of the tree, you know, we've got a pretty good root system formed and actually sort of protected under the concrete. Oh, interesting. If we didn't have the concrete here, we'd have cars driving over the root system. Now, I would not advise to put new concrete in here Okay. at this point in time, because if we put new concrete in here, we would be tearing up the root system to create the sub base for the new concrete. Um, but I would just recommend monitoring this tree, letting, the, letting it be. I would see a good idea, I think, would be the mulch. Yeah, take and the grass out remove that competition for water and nutrients yes what about up here i am seeing some dead branches is that anything we should be concerned about since it's over the house or is it pretty small stuff um we've got a water oak it's um you know it's it's of a median age so a little bit of deadwood is expected that deadwood is about two inches in diameter i might call an arborist you know to prune that Okay. Um, just to avoid the risk of branch failure impacting the deck or the house. Yeah. Uh, but it would definitely be kind of a priority two, priority three kind of thing because it's it's not really a situation where you call them out just for that one thing. Okay, got it. So it's not a super urgent matter. No. Okay. No. This one's got a wild lean too. Yeah, so are we more concerned since this is a tulip poplar tree versus an oak? Um, a little more concerned just cause the wood is weaker. Mm. But one thing I've noticed about tulip poplars over the years is they grow reaction wood faster. Just like they grow fast, they grow reaction wood faster. So it appears as though this tree leaned over, you know, say 15, 20 years ago. It partially uprooted and came towards the old rail bed. And then once it did that, it has shoots growing up. Yeah. And so you see this shoot here low, that's probably a good eight, nine inches in diameter that's growing actually pretty much strong. And then it had extra trees around it, so now it's shooting back for that light gap. Mm -hmm. And the whole time it's been growing, you know, reaction wood on the tension side of the lean. So hardwoods, so, yeah. What do you mean by reaction wood? So when something happens to a tree, when a tree gets loaded, when a tree partially fails, or when we do something to affect its balance, it automatically the, the next day starts growing wood to compensate for that day. And so oak trees and har most hardwoods, all hardwoods, grow it on the tension side of the lean, so they're pulling it back. Um, pines grow it on the compression side, so pines grow it to push up. So is this like if we look at a tree cookie and we're looking at the rings of the tree cookie and we might see that the rings on the right hand side are wider than the rings on the left hand side, that's reaction wood? It's exactly reaction wood. 
and the, the actual pith, you know, you're talking about a cut cookie and the center of that cut cookie would be a tiny, the tiniest circle and that's the pith of the tree. Okay. And like you say, we would see much more growth to the tension side in a hardwood. And the tension side on this tree would be this direction? Would, would be this direction. Yeah. Okay. On the back side of the lean. And so where you would become concerned about this tree being a tulip poplar um, and a poor compartmentalizer of decay yeah. would be if you had decay on the back side of the lean in that tension wood that you need. Okay. Then you would start to become concerned. But if you don't have any kind of decay, kind of looking at the load compared to the size of the trunk, you've got a very small crown compared to that size of trunk. So sometimes a codominant is a concern, um, but what, a, what, you, what again you're looking for is the reaction to, of the tree to the load. So we see a codominant here and it doesn't have any reaction wood coming out either side. I mean, I don't think there's any around this side. Yeah, so there's, there's no reaction wood right here if this codominant were a real issue for this tree as far as loading we would see reaction wood formed out here and we call it elephant ears like you know like say the tree was sticking his fingers behind his ears and pulling it out on either side of this codominant now one thing of concern in this one when you get around me here oh look at that snake skin my goodness um, we've got a pretty good column of decay yeah. going up the right hand lead that may be and bulky. yeah and we've got on the left hand lead we've got a broken out old lead 20 to 30 feet up there with a decay column running up to it so most likely this decay runs up both sides of this tree wow. now this tree you know, a lot of people might say this tree needs to completely come down, but when we're looking at a tree of this size, we would maybe consider what's called a retrenchment pruning, um, where we start slowly taking the tree down over, say, a 10 or 15 year period. The, the retrenchment pruning, what it does is reduce the weight in the crown that lets the wood down here keep it from failing. We've sequestered a lot more carbon in a tree this size, and we're getting a lot more tree benefits right. from a tree this size. So we, we want to maintain it as long as we can. Right. Uh, but we still have to keep risk in mind. So we would get a qualified arborist to make proper reduction cuts in the crown lessening the weight that's just statically suspended on this tree, but also lessening our wind load. Okay. And then in, when we think about target, when we think about this tree being a risk, where will it fall? Do we have any idea of that from looking at it now? You can have a little bit of an idea, but it's very tough to predict where it'll go unless it has just a really dedicated lean towards the target. But with this retrenchment pruning plan, you can control a little bit better where it might fall? I wouldn't say control where it would fall. You're just reducing the risk of the failure mm. down to an acceptable level. Okay. Um, for instance, um, in wind loading experiments that have been done in Canada, yeah. a 10 foot redu proper reduction, 10 to 15 foot proper reduction, can reduce the wind load on a tree up to 35%. Wow. 
And so when you're reducing the wind load, 35% just through a proper reduction by a qualified arborist, you've really cut down a lot of the forces that are exerted on this tree during normal weather and also during our extreme weathers. Okay. And Jonathan, I'm curious, how did the tree get to be like this? Did it start as two different trees or did it start as the same tree? It started as the same tree and something broke the top out of it when it was about six or eight feet tall. Okay. And it became two leads. So what you have in tulip poplars is they're what we call an X current tree, meaning that all of their, they grow in a pyramidal shape and all of the lateral branches are hormonally controlled by what we call the apical meristem. Okay. So the bud at the very top. Mm -hmm. And it says, hey, don't grow past me and hormonally controls the lower branches. Once you take that apical meristem off, you lose the hormonal dominance over the lower branches and they will try to assume the place of the ap apical meristem. Okay. They'll try to grow up and become the main leaf. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. So that's why it's important to prune trees from a young age. It's very important to establish that central leader. Um, it's very important throughout the life of the tree, if something were to happen to the top, is to pick what your next one is and subdominate the other branches properly so that you can reestablish proper tree form. Yeah. And so that, you know, like you say, that's a very important part of young tree structure pruning. Okay. And you know, one other thing I noticed about this tree is there's a lot of vines growing up the side. Right here, I see a lot of English ivy. Is that a concern for trees when we see this much vine growing on it? It is a concern. You know, English ivy is, is a very invasive uh, plant. And so if you have English ivy in your trees, you should go ahead and at least snip around the base every year. Don't don't spend the money or the time removing it from the trunk of the tree, but cut it off down here. It'll die and fall out over the next couple of years and then just maintain it off of the tree at the base. The uh, English ivy holds debris against the bark mm. and can help with decay or okay. speed up decay. It also hides from view any defect. Okay. And would it be adding weight to a defect potentially as well? Definitely could add weight to a defect. Okay. Uh, so yeah. kind of a similar thing to if we get a snowstorm and we see those branches coming down, mm -hmm. we could see a similar effect from vines. You could see a similar effect from vines. Okay.